So welcome everybody. We're very excited to have you join us for today's program. And here's the uh, here's here's Scott Farben. From, he's a building performance analyst. He'll be talking about the first FIAS rehab in Chicago, which is really exciting. We are the Passive House Accelerator. We're a collaborative online platform for sharing innovation and thought leadership in passive house design and construction. We publish articles and interviews. We produce weekly virtual confabs with passive house pioneers from around the world. And we elevate the work and programming of the passive house movements, leaders, practitioners, and organizations through interviews and articles and social media campaigns and videos and podcasts. Our aim is to catalyze zero carbon building by accelerating the adoption of passive house building. With our co-hosts, co Sean St. Amour, Kevin Brennan, Shannon Pendleton, and Mark Willey, we've launched Construction Tech Tuesday to share the technical, the technique, and the technology of passive house construction tech. Each week, we'll welcome guest practitioners to dive into the details of practice with a builder and tradesperson as our target audience. We welcome folks from all corners of the construction and design world to join us each week, and we're happy you're here. With that, I'll hand it off. I just want to welcome everyone to Construction Tech Tuesday. Another great week lined up. We have Scott from Chicago going to talk about FIAS certified retrofits and all the challenges of trying to do passive house and uh, in new markets and a bunch of lessons learned. We're going to see some images of some blower doors. It's going to be awesome. Uh, I'm excited. I'm waiting for your questions and let's get this show on the road. Thanks everyone. I'm Shannon and I'm super excited to be here tonight. I can't wait to see this presentation as well. I know Scott Farben now and you are about to get a good view into his work and the way he thinks and it's a, it's a good ride. So hang on tight and enjoy yourselves. Uh, welcome everyone. Passive House Accelerator Construction Tech. You know, we love to bring forward the technical technique and technology. My name is Mark Willie, and I'm pleased to introduce to you uh, a good friend, Scott Farman. So he is uh, he's currently residing in Chicago, uh, not at large. He's he's uh, his projects are very detail oriented. Scott has, uh, if I remember this right, uh, an architectural background. Uh, also uh, has taken training years back in uh, LEED, BD and C, uh, the solve for memory. Uh, and he's also a certified passive house consultant. So uh, at DBHMS, he's involved in many detailed, large commercial projects. However, what you're gonna see tonight is very special. So it's, a, it's an existing building in Chicago uh, that was that was taken on uh, to be not only rehabbed, not only add an addition, but could it be done to the passive house standard and sold on the free market? That was the challenge. So Scott and a uh, local architect and a good team took on that challenge. And you need to hear it from the man himself. So Scott, you're in charge, brother. Well, thanks, Mark. Appreciate it. Uh, I'm going to share my screen here and let me know if you can see it. And I'm also going to try and get presentation mode. All right. Well, thanks, Mark, for introducing me. And uh, as Mark said, this is going to be a, you know, a pretty quick case study on my first Passive House project, which just so happens to be a very difficult retrofit in the city of Chicago. A quick background about me and, and who I'm with. So Mark had said I'm with DBHMS. We're traditionally a, a design MEP firm, uh, but over the years, we've begun to expand our services and we have a couple of different groups within our organization, specialized, specialized studios, um, a commissioning studio that doesn't just do systems testing, but they do large scale building enclosure commissioning, monitor based commissioning, kind of all the, the good stuff that lead put in front of us at an early point in time. We also have a high performance design studio, which does our uh, performance engineering work. Uh, a lot of the high performing building starts in that studio and then gets passed off to the MEP side, which they uh, execute, you know, the drawings and all that good stuff. Uh, we do early phase, we do compliance modeling, um, everything, you name it. And, and that's, I kind of straddle between high performance and sustainability, which is like, you know, our traditional green certifications and lead and then passive out a little bit of LBC and, and um, some ball certification now too. So 
multifaceted design firm that works on a lot of stuff, but we're also very nimble. We're only about 70 people across the US. Uh, so we're not like Air Up or any of these super big organizations, um, which lets us work on a wide scale of projects. This is why I'm able to do a single family home and I don't have to just stick to commercial all the time. Uh, some quick context for where this project's located because there's a, a, a number of you folks not from the US. So Chicago is in the Midwest, we're off the Great Lakes. I've got it uh, highlighted here for you. And then those of you who are maybe a little bit more familiar with the city where this project is located is on the north side in Ravenswood, which is a pretty um, pretty high, high classy neighborhood within the city of Chicago. A lot of expensive single family homes. A lot of people look to, to live here and raise their family and, and really good schools and things like that. And then where this project is specifically located is um, on the very north end of the block with an alley directly to the north in a neighboring building directly to the south. And I'll talk a little bit more about why that was problematic uh, in the next couple of minutes here. And then um, what made this project really interesting is the, the owner, this is a speculative project, it was never meant to be lived in by the person, by the, the owner of the building. Um, they live in this home right here to the north here, uh, if you see the screen. It was the first lead for homes. I'm pretty sure the first lead for homes building in Chicago. It hit a platinum level and it was uh, designed to be net zero as well. So this is a, a, a client who is a champion of sustainability. He was also on a board of directors uh, for a building called Harmony House for Cats, which is uh, a facility for cats. And, and that was, he pushed to really have that to be net zero too. So. This guy's always thinking high performance, sustainability. He already did lead. He wanted to try the next best, best thing and, and that was brought up as passive house. And the reason, interesting uh, story behind this lot is it was identified and primed for multifamily development. And it was going to be built to maybe about 50 plus feet. And this would have infringed on his solar rights. Uh, as you can see, he's got a number of solar panels here. So his building, his home, which was designed to be net zero would have no longer been operate, operating at a net zero capacity. So he um, got the neighborhood together, got the community together, was able to get some people behind him and said, you know, we, we're not really interested in a large scale multifamily building here. Uh, and, and in doing so kind of the negotiations were that he was gonna try something new and cool. So this home is uh, about over hundred years old. This is what it looked like when it was purchased uh, by Michael. Um, pretty decrepit. Uh, April, who's gonna give a part two of this presentation, uh, I, I don't know quite when, but she'll get into more of the design details and, and kind of how things were when they, when they took it over on their end. But a lot of you know weird animal stuff going on in the house you know wasn't really a, a good place to be so this is what it looked like on the inside when the team started to deconstruct it and uh you know they kept the sheathing on the exterior but it wasn't good enough they were afraid it was going to fall down so they had to do a bunch of lateral bracing just to, to keep things up in the moment uh, and then another interesting discovery the the foundation was a masonry foundation i think they were hoping for a concrete one uh, and with masonry, you know, you bricks are uh, a nasty devil and you want to make sure you don't ruin things uh, with bricks. So that was a consideration as we began to move things forward here. So uh, at a high level, what did we try to do? So uh, in Chicago, Passive House US is, I would say, more widely adopted. FIAS is located here. Their headquarters are here, so they're able to lobby the design industry pretty hard. Um, so I know there's a split amongst a lot of practitioners, uh, PHI versus Passive House US, um, both great programs, just where we ended up was FIAS here. Uh, and with FIAS, we have our Woofy Passive model. This is what um, establishes our design criteria uh, for heating and cooling. Um, I, you know, the platforms are pretty similar. We're, we're looking at annual heating and cooling demand, and then we're looking at peak heating and cooling days, your worst conditions in, in Chicago. Um, these red markers here are the thresholds for compliance. Uh, in this pr particular project, the critical point was the heating load. So on our coolest, uh, I'm sorry, coldest day, you know, how much heat are we gonna be able to get and keep in that building? Um, and as we go through the details here, you'll, you'll find out why this was a bit problematic for us. 
Uh, quickly look at the, the envelope parameters. We've got an R48 typical above grade wall. We've got an R35 below grade wall. We've got a attic layer at about a R100. And then our windows, uh, U of 0.1875 installed. And uh, you know, pretty high solar heat gain coefficient 0.53, trying to bring in as much free solar heating as we could. But if you remember before, we have a neighbor directly to the south. So free heat was uh, at a premium here and it was really tough to get, which is one of the particular reasons as to why this was our mission critical. I want to talk through some of the evolutions of, of details that we did. And I was not the designer on this. I was merely um, consulting and giving my feedback. And, and at the time, uh, full disclosure, this is the first Passive House uh, project I ever worked on. The reason I got my Passive House uh, uh, consulting certification was because of this project. Um, so I was learning on the fly. I was leveraging all the resources at my disposal. I was talking to a lot of folks online uh, and reading a lot about things. So the foundation was interesting. Uh, the decision was not, the decision was made to not excavate around the entire building. It was just too costly. And they, this wasn't something that at the time, the designers, the contractor and the owner wanted to, to do. So because of that, it puts us in a peculiar situation where we have to do this whole inside to outside transition thing for both continuous insulation and air sealing, which is always tricky, tricky, tricky. And it was probably the, the number one reason that hitting or getting to compliance with Passive House was so difficult and ultimately more expensive than we had anticipated. A thing shook out was we, we tried to get an air barrier on the inside of here. It originally started on the interior face of the EPS foam, uh, but before the furred out or the, the stud wall. And after the first blower door test, we discovered that the builder, just by doing, you know, building things, uh, that membrane was being pierced uh, unintentionally all over the place. Uh, something else to mention is that this project was meant to be a, a demonstration. Uh, we wanted to see how hard it would be to make a speculative passive house project at, uh, you know, not a, a ridiculously high cost, and if a conventional builder could pull it off. Um, if you're familiar with the Chicago region, there's a really great passive house practitioner, Tom Bassett Dilly. He's done a, probably the most of house certified buildings that I know of. And he typically relied on Brandon Weiss, who was the, the builder, and he did all these projects. And, you know, that's not sustainable. You can't just have one company, one builder doing all the Passive House buildings in Chicago. We wouldn't be able to do, we, we couldn't get to scale that way. And, you know, all of us are ultimately interested in doing these things because we want to have an impact on the built environment. Uh, we all believe in climate change. We know that we have to do something to, to mitigate all the bad stuff from happening. So. If we want more passive houses in Chicago, we need to have more people who are familiar with how to do it and how to build it. More blower doors told us more about what we were doing wrong, which is funny. And you know, I'm uh, able to learn from my mistakes. I don't think I'm the greatest designer or consultant in the world. Uh, so I know things are gonna go wrong and we need to be able to adapt on the fly. Ultimately what happened is we had to spray foam a bit more than, than we wanted down here and then the, the yeah, I'm sorry. We moved the, the air barrier to the outside of the wood stud wall and that still didn't seem to help us. And then we said, okay, spray foam, last resort, let's get it in there and, and see how that helps. So you hear some photos of kind of the, the way things progressed. Uh, originally, you know, this air uh, membrane was on the inside and that wasn't working for us. It moved to the outside of the framing, still wasn't working for us went with more spray foam. Uh, and I'll talk about a bit more of the spray foam as we move into the above grade wall here. How we would have liked to approach it is no spray foam at all. We really wanted to use mineral wool in the cavity and a limited amount of EPS on the exterior. Uh, being conscious of embodied carbon, um, we know that foam isn't typically the best performer in, in green, greenhouse gas emissions, uh, you know, square foot to square foot of, uh, uh, insulation here. So I got a doorbell here. <laughs> you heard that. Um, 
but because of the constraints of the site and the way things work with the criteria we needed to hit for passive house, we needed to rely on the extra R value from spray foam. So the cavity evolved to a spray foam cavity. Uh, and we originally wanted to do a rain screen with furring strips, but that came in more expensive than just plywood. So this is uh, the evolution of the above grade wall. And again, you know, I get a lot of flack for all the foam, but ultimately this is what was needed to get to the compliance. And, and we weren't trying to do just a passive house ready or certifiable building. We really wanted to get the certification. It was very meaningful. So we had to make some compromises on elements of the design as we progress through through the construction period and, and the discovery of, of elements we weren't expecting. Here's a, a bit of woofy background that describes what I just uh, was talking about. Where we wound up was getting free heat from the neighbor, uh, from the south because of the neighbor. We needed spray foam in the cavity and we had five inches of continuous exterior insulation. Uh, if we swapped out the cavity spray foam for mineral wool, we would have been above our design heating day threshold here. So that didn't work. Um, and then, you know, in a perfect scenario, if I could have put this building anywhere, uh, we would have had free solar heating from the south. Uh, we would have had mineral wool cavity and the insulation, and we would have been able to drop down the, the exterior continuous to four inches. So shave off an inch of that, and we would have been perfectly good to go on the, the PS criteria. But this is a renovation, it's an existing building. It was a site picked for a specific reason. So you got to work with what you're, you're dealt there. I, I want to talk a little bit more about the, the active systems uh, because we are an engineering firm and we like to, to try new things uh, when given the opportunity. So um, a lot of this is, you know, typical to Passive House building. We have a heat pump-esque heating and cooling system. We've got our ERV for ventilation and fresh air, energy recovery, and then, um, you know, a handful of yeah, high wall uh, terminal units. Um, this is a larger single family home. You know, uh, we're not trying to make, it, it wasn't the most efficient building, you know, 1,000, 1,500 square feet. This was closer to 4,000, it's three stories. We didn't think, you know, a mini split was gonna cut it. Uh, so we were exploring different options. We approached it for more of a commercialized uh, strategy. We do a lot of VRF buildings in our, uh, VRF designs in our multifamily, and that's a variable refrigerant flow, which is essentially a condensing unit that hooks up to uh, a handful of high wall or uh, fan coil end terminals. And then it's a, a condensing loop that these things could share off of. You could share heat, you could heat one side, you could cool the other side and heat recovery. Um, so that's what we wanted to, to try here initially. Uh, on the ERV side, we have our Zender units and uh, a hybrid electric heat pump for hot water, and then just enough PV to, to hit our energy source requirements that FIAS dictate. Interesting component of Chicago, uh, as progressive of a city as we like to say we are, uh, there's still a lot of antiquated components of the way things work in Chicago. So there's its own ventilation code. It doesn't follow IMC, uh, it doesn't follow ASHRAE, uh, it follows the Chicago ventilation code. And that says you need to have 1.5 CFM per square foot of kitchen or bathroom, or you need a, a operable window for natural ventilation. So not really the ideal situations for a, a passive house building. There's some contradictory design theory there uh, that doesn't really match up. And what ultimately happened was the one bathroom in the basement couldn't get an operable window. So we had to provide 1.5 CFM per square foot. And that was 90 CFM, over three times more than what the, the passive house strategies call for, which is 20 CFM a continuous. That's a lot of air to have to account for. And it resulted in us having to upside, upsize the ERV, which was unfortunate. It's a more costly unit. You don't need it. There's a ton of passive houses that do it without 90 CFM of intermittent exhaust. Uh, but that's kind of the hoop we had to jump through in order to get through the city of Chicago. On the heating and cooling side, on the left here, this was our uh, original design. We had one condensing unit, as I mentioned, and then you have a refrigerant loop with heat recovery branches at each level where you could have heating and cooling in the space, didn't matter where it was, high level controllability, pretty much any occupiable space was going to have its own 
thermostat. Um, only certain areas would need to be heated and cooled at a certain time. Uh, it, it really like the, the, the gold standard for controllability, flexibility, adaptability, super cool. But it was really expensive. It was $90,000. Um, where we ended up going was in it down to two condensing units and then really compromising on, on the controllability. So instead of having a high wall fan coil or terminal unit in every occupiable space, we made a compromise and went to a couple vertical air handlers that would serve multiple bedrooms. So on the top floor, there'd be one air handler serving three bedrooms instead of three high wall units for three bedrooms. That saved a lot of money. Uh, it still gave you some controllability and flexibility, but not as much as we would have liked. Um, really pride ourselves on the ability to, to deliver high levels of thermal comfort. Um, so this was something we had to, to deal with in, in the progression of, of the design process and, and the phases. And obviously cost is a real issue, so you can't do everything you want. Speaking of cost, a uh, couple numbers here. Um, so the first one, and this was from our, our conventional builder who was working with us, they said that they do custom home renovations. And this is renovated costs, so hard costs only, no fees or anything like that. So just the hard costs. They're working in a 200 to $300 per square foot uh, level. We were able to get just the renovation costs again down to $192 square, uh, dollars per square feet, which is pretty great. Um, we're coming in cheaper than the custom home. You're still getting your custom finishes and you're still getting a really like high level of design, sustainability, performance, um, equipment, like you name it. You're, this is like top notch. And then finally, uh, if we're doing a new build, a little bit cheaper for, for them to build this, you don't have you know, the headaches and the nuances of a renovated projects. So they could do it for quite a bit cheaper there, but just interesting price points. Um, because of the project, we're able to share some of this stuff. Uh, so hopefully it's helpful. Uh, blower doors, we did a ton of them. Uh, our internal commissioning team was actually the, the fiest rater on this as well. So I was able to work very closely with a person that I've worked with in the past on other projects and we just had a good working relationship. And I told them from the start, we're gonna need to do a ton of blower doors. Uh, every time we did a blower door, we found new problems, whether it's leaking through the windows, they weren't installed as well as you had hoped, uh, or uh, a mishap with the sequence in which the, the second floor was framed. So this is a photo of the attic. Uh, we originally wanted the air barrier. If we go all the way back here to the original diagram, uh, this continuous air barrier is on the top of the attic here. It was supposed to be on the bottom. That didn't work out like we had planned because the builder framed up the entire second floor to the bottom of the, the ceiling joist before we could tell him, stop, don't do that. So what we had to do you know, we had to pivot our strategy. They did a, a sheathing on top of the, the ceiling joist in the attic here. And then we had to tape it all, spray foam it all. Uh, not the desired outcome, but hey, you know, this is a learning process and things happen and we need to be able to adapt. We did at least uh, six blower doors that I could remember. I'm sure there were more than that because I wasn't out there every time, but this is what I had documented. Um, we did a number of them in October, uh, four of them, and we started at 2,400 in our uh, desired CFM that we were shooting for was ab about 500 CFM. So we were way over where we needed to be. And this was, you know, air barrier is already up, supposedly supposed to be airtight, um, but wasn't working. Came back, this is, this is when we discovered, you know, holes in the basement, air barrier uh, needed to address a couple things. We after this next iteration, we found that some of the, the supposed closed cell spray foam was actually open cell spray foam. So it wasn't doing the air sealing that we were hoping for in, in those areas. Back again, we get it down 1,600, you know, we're chipping away each time, finding new issues to seal up and, and come at it again. Uh, the next time we're at 850, we were doing more spray foam. Uh, ultimately, we get out kind of plateau around 750. Uh, and this is um, around the time when I, I gave this similar presentation at the Passive House Conference in DC in, in 2019. And this is when the community really came to, to help out. And they said, have you heard of this thing called Aero Barrier? And I said, no, I haven't because 
I don't work in the single family home uh, realm all the time. And it's essentially, I'm sure you all know about it, but I'll describe it quickly. You set up your blower door, you pressurize the house, you have a nozzle that shoots out this chemical and it, because the house is pressurized, it migrates to all the holes wherever air is trying to escape and it fully builds up those holes. I think it can cover up to like a, a half inch of a diameter, which is pretty big. Uh, they were out there for maybe an hour or two and they got it down below 500 CFM per square foot of enclosure, which was our target, uh, which is amazing. Um, I know that there's a lot of people out there that probably don't want to rely on aero barrier. Uh, they want to be able to design and execute a, an air sealed building without it. But I think you have to be realistic, uh, especially in the renovation uh, category. I think you know, this is something you might need to rely on a little bit more. And, and had we known about it ahead of time, maybe we could have used less spray foam in, in certain areas. And there could have been a nice uh, greenhouse gas emissions trade off there if, if I was, you know, more tuned in to, to what was going on there. Uh, during all the blower doors, we also do thermal imaging. Uh, we were finding that there were just more leaks than we expected and not in the obvious locations all the time. Uh, we expected, expected due to the continuous air barrier on the exterior that we wouldn't have too much leakage at uh, you know floor to wall seams, corner seams, et cetera, but they were still there. Uh, and this is what we found in some of the thermal imaging um, that we took. So we really had to go back through and make sure that the builder was aware that this stuff happens. Like they didn't know you're leaking air through corners and where framing members were coming together. The, the uh, original existing framing, if I'll go back to the photo later, but it was very porous, 100 years old, two by four. Uh, if you put your hand up during the blower door test, you could feel air moving through those two by fours. Uh, it was wild. So I wouldn't have expected that. Uh, so really took a whole nother level of air sealing to get there. And I think that's why the aero barrier was so successful. And this is uh, what it ended up looking like. Um, pretty cool design by April Hughes and HPZS. I think what's really cool is that you have a home and, and I'll throw out the number because it's public data and you could look it up on, on Redfin, but the home sold for $1.5 million. And I would say that the mentality in the US from what I've seen is these high wall units are cheap. And if I live in a million dollar plus house, I don't wanna see that stuff on my wall. This home sold on its first showing and it got the asking price. This, this sort of mentality I, I think is hopefully breaking, breaking away and um, you'll see it a lot more frequently. I know if you all are, are doing passive house homes, you see stuff like this all the time, but if you're working on market rate, you know, very expensive stuff, I, I hope that, you know, the, the mentality is changing there and people, and maybe it's just the right person for the right home, but I'd like to think that we're gonna see more of this uh, widely through, through the general uh, built environment. That's it from me on this presentation. Thanks so much for listening. And I would be happy to answer questions to the best of my ability. Uh, apologies if I have to defer any of them until uh, April's here, or if I just don't have the, have the knowledge there. But I will Scott, I think uh, I, I think can. all of us are going to unmute for a second and give you a quick round of applause for taking on an existing building. <laughs> Thank mm -hmm. you. Cheers. And on your and, first try. <laughs> and, and for those of you that aren't familiar with the codes in Chicago, that deserves a second, third, and fourth applause. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, thanks, Mark. I, I will say too that the, um, I'll go back really quickly because this is an interesting note. The north side wall was a non-conforming existing condition. So it was already over the setback as is. Uh, and we needed to come back through and put on five inches of continu continuous exterior insulation on top of that. So we needed to move, you know, five inches of insulation plus our new cladding, like I think eight-ish plus or minus on top of that. And fortunately, Chicago <clears throat> isn't like New York, where New York's great. They don't, uh, uh, exterior insulation doesn't count against your zoning setbacks in New York, but we're Chicago. We're not that cool yet. It does. So there was an administrative relief, pro relief, uh, relief process that took many months 
and many dollars, uh, unfortunate. Um, it took a lot of paperwork to just be able to have a north elevation with continuous installation. There was a, a point in which we had to get real and we're like, is this possible if we can't put continuous insulation on the north side of the wall? Like that was a real consideration. And that's not a place you'd expect to be when you're trying to do a, a progressive project that is not only a, a showcase, but something that's trying to do good in the built environment. You shouldn't be penalized for something like that. So that it, it, through advocacy work and some other networks of we're, we're really trying to, to get that solved in Chicago. And for those uh, in Canada of the different provinces and the different states and regions of the U.S., a lot of the housing in Chicago proper is just as the photograph that Scott has uh, uh, delineated with the with the red dashed lines. It is east west orientated. Uh, the right right north of that alley, it it changes there, but predominantly in Chicago, it's all east west oriented. So the other factor that's interesting in a project like this and, and existing buildings is, is the ability to replicate, right? To take this lesson learned and say, this happened to this structure. We have the same orientation. We have the same footprint. We have the same setbacks. And we have predominantly the same amount of, uh, of, of usable room. This was an oversized lot on an alley, which was added concerns, uh, but uh, really, really proper. Kevin, I, I hand the microphone to you. I know uh, you've got something to start us off with. Uh, great project and, you know, like fight the good fight with the city <laughs> of Chicago. Um, uh, in New York City, that fight was taken on by Chris Benedict and Henry Gifford, and they won us the ability to add eight inches of insulation on the outside. Um, uh, they fought that tooth and nail and they got it through and now it's a staple. Um, uh, so go for those variances and try and get it through. And, you know, like, I don't know how they did it, but they did a great job and they really, they, they, they made it easier for everyone. Um, uh, another point to put out is that, you know, my quick monkey math of, uh, of your blow a door number was that you had your first go out of it was 2,500 CFM which if your goal was 0.6, it comes out to that it was around three air changes per hour. That's our code in New York City right now of your, your regular house. And a lot of the builders are using spray foam on new construction to hit their blow a door testing numbers and spray foam gets them like almost right there. They're either over or it's right at like three air changes per hour. And uh, it's great to, uh, it's, it, it, it's, it's great to use the product, but it doesn't get you to that 0.6. And uh, that's the extra love and the, and the membranes and everything like that. I think there's some value that you guys could have gotten out of maybe some of the other materials that you used. I try and personally use materials that give me dual purpose, that they do two things at once. Uh, and quality of your spray foam installer. <laughs> so those guys are trained and make sure they're, they're, they bring in the right products. If anyone's ever looking for a great spray foam training program, look and ask them what, what training programs they take. Are they ABAA certified? Are they, uh, have they taken any training by a manufacturer certification? You really want the most professional spray foam, spray foam installer that you can do. And there's some quality control uh, issues you can take into your own hands of measuring density and you know nerding out and adhesion testing and stuff, but it's not as hard as you may think it would be, but great project. And you know, in New York City, we started with, uh, with one project that was a, a fight uphill and there were a lot of challenges and then they replicate. And in those finer, nicer neighborhoods, you, it starts to catch a little bit of fire, you know, no, no Chicago fire uh, reference there, but um, uh, <laughs> it, those next day of neighbors want a, a more comfortable home. They want, they want the same thing that their neighbors have. Oh, he got, he sold his house in one day, you know, like they love that. So thanks Scott. Pleasure. Shannon, you, you're, you, you got some feedback for us before we get into more questions. Absolutely. Uh, I just can't get enough of this project, doing it for your first time and uh, and hitting your marks, even though you had to do a couple of blower doors to get there is really impressive. And especially going with a builder that you didn't have, uh, you know, a lot of experience with either. So you guys were really building the race car as you were racing the Indy 500 and my hat is off to you. Um, I have some questions for you, but I think we're going to wait on those for a couple minutes. Is that right, Mark? Or should we get, 
or should we roll with that? Yeah, we got, we, let's dive right in. Go, go right. to your cue, Shannon. Absolutely. So <laughs> and, and, and Shannon, ask the question slow because Scott needs a chance to have a glass of water here. I know. He's a good <laughs> speed talker. Um, Harvey was first. He's got a couple questions. And then Dan Welch and Kevin from Building Evolution are right after him. Harvey, do you want to ask your question? Sure. Well, I have I had a whole bunch, but I'm just gonna I'm gonna stick on two. Thank um, you. You're welcome. Um, the first one, you know, we've all are so impressed that you didn't do any previous work by getting certified as a consultant. So, my first question is, what were your biggest challenges on the learning front, not being certified prior to undertaking this house? That'll be question number one. If you answer that correctly, then question number two, which is a very easy one, which is, was it balloon? Was the house balloon frame? Because it's an older, yeah, uh, older home. Good question. Okay. Thanks. Uh, uh, part one, I would say um, continuous insulation and air sealing is a really easy concept to understand on paper, but executing it in real life is incredibly difficult and not having a lot of background and experience executing it on site, seeing it, seeing how it goes together, doing the testing. I think that limited my ability uh, quite a bit to, to pre-plan for it. Um, it wasn't just me, luckily, there was other people uh, on the project that were able to, to, to consult and comment. Uh, I think, you know, we ultimately got there, probably could have gotten there in a different, easier, better way. Um, and I would know how to do it next time, which is great. Uh, and I had the, you know, privilege to, to kind of roll in with it on this one. And I know that that's not always the case. Uh, the client was really great. He was really understanding of any time we had to pivot or make a change. And uh, as long as there's a good explanation reason to it and it wasn't going to cost him tens of thousands of dollars, he, he was okay. So. I was blessed with the situation. I know that um, could have gone differently. And then part two, yes, balloon frame. Yes, thank you, Scott, and thanks, thanks Harvey. Scott. Yeah, just this is a follow-up. Did that present anything easier, or did it present another challenge because it was blue, balloon frame? I think the balloon frame usually ends up not to be a benefit, from what I've seen in pretty much every application. Um, I would say not not a advantage in this one. Yeah, I guess it would the only thing I would think of would be where your air barrier is, right? On the outside of make it you're not going on the inside and wrapping around. Okay. Yep. Thanks so much. No, my pleasure. Thanks so much, Harvey. Um, we have a question from Dan Welch. If Dan's still on, Dan, would you like to come on and ask your question? Sure. Uh, first, real quick one. Was that 2015 or 2018 FIAS <laughs> metrics? Good 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 question. Uh, we started in 2015. Uh, we were having a lot of trouble hitting the uh, the heating load, and at one point, it, this okay. This was the really awesome benefit of being in Chicago and doing the FIAS program, as I had access to to James and, and Lisa and Katrin at FIAS HQ, and and they were really nice in helping me out. And they tossed me a bone, and they said, "Hey, we're actually developing." 2018 right now and there's a pilot program opportunity if you want to get involved and that was when they started to reconfigure their design criteria and they had a calculator where it was enclosure to floor area ratio and occupant to occupant density and, and those recalculations helped us get closer to, to where we needed to be so it, it ultimately got certified under 2018. Did you have to take one of the, the free mulligans to get there? <laughs> Uh, yeah, kind of, um, it, we, it, it, yes and no, um, we had to rely on a bit more offsite renewable energy to hit the more stringent source energy requirements. Uh, we designed the, the energy to hit the 2015, which was the, uh, 50 to 60 kilowatt hours per person. And, and 2018 ratcheted it up quite a bit to like 32, 60. I, I can't, I'm sorry. I don't remember the exact off my head, but. Uh, to, to make that difference, we had to buy uh, renewable energy okay. certificates. So 
you know, I don't like playing the offset game, but it was, again, a, a compromise to getting into the 2018 platform. Sure. And it, it, I mean, it still makes great buildings, so. Yeah, exactly. More um, of a, a compromise on the certification platform than the, than the building itself. Yeah. Yeah. And so one additional quick question. Now that you know about Aero Barrier, would you have changed your process looking at spray foam? And I think, what applications you would have done materiality wise? Yes. Wow. I, good question. Yeah, yeah. Good question. Yeah. Um, 100%. I, you know, I think I, I mentioned it a little bit and I'll try and expand. Uh, I wouldn't have relied on spray foam for any air sealing. I would rewind that 100%. I would only rely on it to where, because of the, the extra R value, we needed to hit that heating threshold. And like, I played around with it a lot. Um, I was getting close to how much we could do on the exterior. If you remember, we had more than anyone would ever need in the attic. And I still, <laughs> I still couldn't make it work with, with mineral wool or, or, you know, that level of R value that you would get from more of a natural compound or natural uh, insulation. Um, so I would only use spray foam where I needed to get the extra R value out of it. I think it was like six, I think this one was like 6.9 or maybe even seven per inch. So uh, really need the R value. So I would have engaged Aero Barrier much earlier. I would have uh, probably would have designed around it a bit more, included it more into the thought process and the execution of the project. And I would have used way less spray foam. Like we wouldn't need the spray from the basement that could have gone back to what it was originally just meant to be. Um, Going to a couple more embodied carbon presentations, I would explore a different product than EPS as well. Uh, but this graphite infused EPS was R5 per inch, which is insane, I think, as far as I know, that, that's really high. So made sense. Uh, a lot of people I work with don't like uh, the semi-rigid mineral wool on the exterior, even though it's a hydrophobic material, they've seen horror stories of it getting wet and not working well. Um, that's anecdotal, of course. That, that surprises me. They, yeah, I, I, I've heard, it, this is what they told me. They said they've seen mineral wool coming out of weep holes. Really? Wow. Huh. Could have just been like the perfect storm of conditions. Uh, I don't yeah. know. And I'm not going to like, I don't put me on the record on that. That was yeah. what I, mean, I was we, told. We just really like it because it's just so, it is so drainable. I, I could see where you did, could have some potential issues, but we had a building with a 30 foot um, back wall that was just completely mineral walls in the middle of winter the entire time. And the, only the bottom, like two inches had any water in it. The rest of the wall, and this is in the Pacific Northwest. So it's raining like every single day on that wall. Yeah. So yeah. I think, I don't know, feel safer than foam, but yeah. thanks for the presentation. My pleasure. And just to add on top of that, um, uh, the PHI world out there, you're able to use the Enerfit standard, which gives you kind of like that mulligan of doing one air change per hour, because throughout Europe, they realize that taking an old building and making it airtight is not very easy. So you guys had the extra challenge of hitting 0. 0.6 and getting that super air tightness. Uh, and then the other part is the, the way to hit pass about certification. There's many ways with Enerfit by component. There's Enerfit by, by, by the other, the regular traditional standard of modeling, but the one air change per hour does help a lot. A lot of the projects we work on are 200, 150 year old brownstones and you're not getting every surface and you have to fight every tooth and nail to get that close to one air change per hour, even 0.6. So um, uh, you guys, you guys did an excellent job. And then my one suggestion is with the arrow barrier is put the layers in that are supposed to be there, test them. And then if they don't make it, use the arrow barrier at the end, I put, I would like, I would like to suggest people put it in there as like the penalty for lack of craftsmanship or like a workaround or something in there. It's really not that expensive. I mean, I don't know how much it costs per square foot, but if you shared the cost with the, with the, with the air barrier installer or somebody like that, I think it makes it achievable. Um, uh, but it really, it's a fix. It's not really your primary ceiling method, in my opinion. Yeah, and I would resonate that 100%, Kevin. I didn't mean to say I would use it as my primary strategy. No, no, no. I, I agree. Definitely get the layers in there and then use it as a last resort. And I think that it was like a couple thousand bucks to, to do it in this house. It, it's like dirt cheap, comparatively speaking. So it's a good fault. Set it up.
if they set it up and they're running it, keep them, keep running it. Let's go to point two, point five. <laughs> you're paying them to set up and to run it. You know, I mean, uh, the guys out in, what is it? Uh, you know him, the arrow, what's, I'm forgetting his name. Oh, he's going to kill me. Jake Burton. <laughs> he, uh, he got it down to like 0.15. If you have it set up, just run the material through it. Set up, run it another hour, and you'll, you'll see that curve come down. Um, uh, makes for an even tighter building. I'll, uh, the architect on that project, Kevin is, uh, is here. So I'll let Steve answer was that before uh, I get thrown aside. <laughs> Kevin it was 0.07. I was there. <laughs> That's that, that'll get the golden blow door award. <laughs> that was 0.07 before it was insulated. Right. And certainly well, we were at point, Jake had it at like 0.29 before we used arrow barrier. Okay. That's amazing. Yeah. And that's with the framing crew. Well, that's not his guys doing it. Yeah, but you guys, the buildings you guys are building using zip wall, it's such an it's such a nice system that goes to Gale Weather that it's it's it makes sense taping seams and lining things up. Green, you know. So you guys, he does a good job training his guys, and Jake's got a really good handle on how to put it together. We collaborate on the buildings together, so we're right from the get go. We're on the same page. There's a, there's a lot of advantages to what we do. So, uh, we're at, we're at 10 to seven, Zach, do you want to take the reins for a minute here? Yeah, sure. Absolutely. So I'm going to, I, I want to thank our sponsors. Um, as you know, everyone on the call, probably, or if you don't know, I'll, I'll share now that the, the only way that we're able to do our work is thanks to our sponsors. Um, and I have to uh, apologize in advance to all of you and our sponsors for the background noise because I have a couple of boys who are, are um, <laughs> I don't know what they're doing. They're playing some crazy card game. Anyway, our founding sponsors are 475 High Performance Building Supply, Backstinkwe Architects, Glavel Foam Glass Gravel, Minotaur All-in-One HVAC and Dehumidification, Mitsubishi Electric Train HVAC US, Partel, RDH Building Science, Stocorp, and Zola Windows. And our stakeholder partner is NYSERDA. Our patron sponsors are BR Plus A Consulting Engineers, Brennan Brennan Insulation and Air Tightness, Innotech Windows and Doors, and US Engineered Wood T Stud. We have a great Passive House podcast episode live right now. It's with Kate Nason of Atelier 10, and she uh, presents about her work in Australia. And um, Kate has become a leader and pioneer of Passive House in Australia at a, at a um, young age and um, has been uh, really an, an inspiring figure. So she, her conversation with Matthew Cutler Welsh um, is, a, is one not to miss. Please check it out. Tomorrow, our Passive House Happy Hour will feature uh, the construction tech's own Shannon Pendleton, along with Ilka Cassidy, who is also a guest host on our podcast, and Angela Eraldi, who I think is on the call right now. Um, and they'll be presenting about the Silver Spring Passive House Fias Plus 2018 pre-certified Passive House project um, from, from three different perspectives. It's a really interesting conversation or presentation. And <laughs> just a second, you guys, can you, you can be a little quieter? No! <laughs> It's a cage match going on, a barbed wire nice cage. Try. <laughs> did you see? Did you hear the reaction? <laughs> no. Okay. So on Thursday we have a cross pollinator event that that Mark Willie is moderating, and it will it will be looking at the programming between BS Plus Beer, uh, BS Friday, Pass House Accelerator, and Pass House Canada. These are all organizations who are doing passive house or building science related social programming. And we're gonna be talking about what's coming up next and uh, how things might evolve in the, in the coming months um, as all of our lives change with, uh, with the evolution of our COVID situation. Next week, our construction tech will feature Jeff Lang Langford um, from Code to High Performance. Please join us for that. And our happy hour will be with uh, Mikhail Wasuf, of, uh, um, who's based in Barcelona, and he'll be talking about a public school interfit project there. With that, I will mute and please enjoy the rest of the program.